The Battle of Moncontour by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Read for LibriVox.org by Kevin Siegel. Oh, weep for Moncontour! Oh, weep for the hour when the children of darkness and evil had power, when the horsemen of valor triumphantly trod on the bosoms that bled for their rights and their god. Oh, weep for Moncontour! Oh, Weep for the slain, who for faith and for freedom lie slaughtered in vain. Oh, weep for the living, who linger to bear the renegade's shame or the exile's despair. One look, one last look, to our cots and our towers, to the rows of our vines and the beds of our flowers, to the church where the bones of our fathers decayed, where we fondly had deemed that our own would be laid. Alas! We must leave thee, dear desolate home, to the spearmen of Uri, the shavelings of Rome, to the serpent of Florence, the vulture of Spain, to the pride of Anjou, and the guile of Lorraine. Farewell to thy fountains, farewell to thy shades, to the song of thy youths, and the dance of thy maids, to the breath of thy gardens, the hum of thy bees, and the long waving line of blue Pyrenees. Farewell, and forever, the priest and the slave may rule in the halls of the free and the brave. Our hearts we abandon, our lands we resign, but, Father, we kneel to no altar but thine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. But if our love be dying, by Michael Field. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist But if our love be dying, let it die as the rose shedding secretly, or as a noble music's pause. Let it move rhythmic as the laws of the sea's ebb, or the sun's ritual when sovereignly he dies. Then let a mourner rise and three times call upon our love, and the long echoes fall. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. Courting in Kentucky by Florence E. Pratt Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio When Mary Ann Dollinger got the school down there on Injun Bay, I was glad, for I like to see a gal making her honest way. I heard some talk in the village about her flying high, too high for busy farmer folks with chores to do to fly. But I pay no sort of attention to all the talk until she come in her regular boarding round to visit with us a spell. My Jake and her had been cronies ever since they could walk, and it took me aback to hear her correcting him in his talk. Jake ain't no hand at grammar, though he ain't his beat for work. But I says to myself, look out, my gal, you're a-foolin' with a Turk. Jake bore it wonderful patient, and said in a mournful way he presumed he was behindhand with the doings at Injun Bay. I remember once he was askin' for some of my engine buns, and she said he should always say, them air stead of them is the ones well mary ann kept at him steady mornin and evenin long till he dasn't open his mouth for fear o talkin wrong one day i was pickin currants down by the old quince tree when i hear jake's voice a sayin be you willin to marry me and mary ann correctin air ye willin you should say our jake he put his foot down in a plumb decided way no women folks is a goin to be rearrangin me hereafter i says craps them is i calculate and i be if folks don't like my talk they needn't hark to what i say but i ain't a goin to take no sass from folks from injun bay I ask you, free, 
and final be ye goin to marry me and mary ann says tremblin yet anxious like i be in the poem this recording is in the public domain death be not proud by john dunn read for LibriVox.org by winston tharp death be not proud though some have called thee mighty and dreadful for thou art not so for those whom thou thinkst thou dost overthrow die not poor death nor yet canst thou kill me from rest and sleep which but thy pictures be much pleasure then from thee much more must flow, And soonest our best men with thee do go, Rest of their bones and souls' delivery. Thou art slave to fate, chance, kings, and desperate men, And dost with poison, war, and sickness dwell, And poppy or charms can make us sleep as well, And better than thy stroke. Why swell'st thou then? One short sleep past we wake eternally and death shall be no more death thou shalt die end of poem this recording is in the public domain deep in the night by sarah teasdale read for librivox.org by Shakira, June 2015 Deep in the night, the cry of a swallow, Under the stars he flew. Keen as pain was his call to follow, Over the world to you. Love in my heart is a cry forever lost As the swallow's flight seeking for you and never never stilled by the stars at night end of poem this recording is in the public domain the duck and the kangaroo by edward lear read for LibriVox.org by algie pug said the duck to the kangaroo Good gracious, how you hop over the fields and the water too, as if you never would stop. My life is a bore in this nasty pond, and I long to go out in the world beyond. I wish I could hop like you, said the duck to the kangaroo. Please give me a ride on your back, said the duck to the kangaroo. I would sit quite still and say nothing but quack the whole of the long day through, when we go the dee and the jelly bo lee over the land and over the sea please take me a ride oh do said the duck to the kangaroo said the kangaroo to the duck this requires some little reflection perhaps on the whole it might bring me luck and there seems but one objection which is if you'll let me speak so bold your feet are unpleasantly wet and cold and would probably give me the rheumatiz said the kangaroo said the duck as i sat on the rocks i have thought over that completely and i bought four pairs of worsted socks which fit my web feet neatly and to keep out the cold i bought a cloak and every day a cigar i'll smoke all to follow my own dear true love of a kangaroo said the kangaroo i'm ready all in the moonlight pale but to balance me well dear duck sit steady and quite at the end of my tail so away they went with a hop and a bound and they hopped the whole world three times round and who so happy oh who as the duck and the kangaroo end of poem this recording is in the public domain eureka by henry lawson Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles Eureka Roll up Eureka's heroes on that grand old rush afar, For Layla's gone to join you in the big camp 
where you are. Roll up and give him welcome such as only diggers can, for well he battled for the rights of miner and of man. And there in that bright golden land that lies beyond our sight, the record of his honest life shall be his miner's right. Here many a bearded mouth shall twitch, and many a tear be shed, and many a grey old digger sigh to hear that Layla's dead. But wipe your eyes, old fossickers, o'er worked-out fields that roam. You need not weep at parting from a digger going home. Now from the strange wild seasons past the days of golden strife, now from the roaring fifties comes a scene from Layla's life, all gleaming white amid the shafts or gully, hill and flat. Again I see the tents that form the camp at Ballarat. I hear the shovels and the picks, and all the air is rife with the rattle of the cradles and the sounds of digger life. The clatter of the windless bowls, the spinning round they go, and then the signal to his mate, the diggers cry, below. From many a busy pointing forge the sound of labour swells, the tinkling at the anvils is as clear as silver bells. I hear the broken English from the mouth at least of one, from every state and nation that is known beneath the sun. The homely tongue of Scotland and the brogue of Ireland blend with the dialects of England from Berwick to Land's End. And to the busy concourse here the West has sent a part, the land of gulches that has been immortalised by heart, the land where long from mining camps the blue smoke upward curled, the land that gave that partner true a Maclis unto the world. The men from all the nations in the new world and the old, all side by side like brethren here, are delving after gold. But suddenly the warning cries are heard on every side, as, closing in around the field, a ring of troopers ride. Unlicensed diggers are their game, their class and want are sins, and so, with all its shameful scenes, the digger hunt begins. The men are seized who are too poor the heavy tax to pay, and they are chained as convicts were and dragged in gangs away. While in the eye of many a mate is menace scarcely hid, the digger's blood was slow to boil, but scalded when it did. But now another match is held that sure must light the charge, a digger murdered in the camp, his murderer at large. Roll up, roll up, the pregnant cry awakes the evening air, and angry faces surge like waves around the speakers there. What are our sins that we should be an outlawed class, they say? Shall we stand by while mates are seized and dragged like lags away? Shall insult be on insult heaped? Shall we let these things go? And on a roar of voices comes the digger's answer, No! The day has vanished from the scene, but not the air of night can cool the blood that, ebbing back, leaves brows in anger white. Lo, from the roof of Bentley's Inn the flames are leaping high. They write revenge in letters red across the smoke-dim sky. Now the oppressed will drink no more humiliation's cup. Call out the troops, read martial law, the digger's blood is up. To arms, to arms, the cry is out, to arms if man thou art. For every pike upon a pole will find a tyrant's heart. Now Layla comes to take the lead, the spirit does not lag, and down the rough wild diggers kneel beneath the digger's flag, and rising to their feet they swear, while rugged hearts beat high, to stand beside their leader, and to conquer or to die. Around Eureka's stockade now the shades of night close fast, three hundred sleep besides their arms, and thirty sleep their last. Around about fair Melbourne town the sounds of bells are born, that call the citizens to prayer this fateful Sabbath morn. But there upon Eureka's hill, a hundred miles away, the diggers' forms lie white and still above the blood-stained clay. The bells that ring the diggers' death might also ring a knell, 
for those few gallant soldiers dead who did their duty well there's many a someone's heart shall ache and many a someone care for many a someone's darling lies all cold and pallid there and now in smoking ruins lie the huts and tents around the digger's gallant flag is down and trampled in the ground the sight of murdered heroes is to hero hearts a goad a thousand men are up in arms upon the creswick road and wildest rumours in the air are flying up and down tis said the men of ballarat will march upon the town but not in vain those diggers died their comrades may rejoice for o'er the voice of tyranny is heard the people's voice it says reform your rotten law the diggers wrongs make right or else with them our brothers now will gather in the fight and now before my vision flash the scenes that followed fast the trials and the triumph of the diggers cause at last twas of such stuff the men were made who saw our nation born and such as layla were the men who led their footsteps on and of such men there'll many be and of such leaders some in the roll-up of australians on some dark day yet to come End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Exotic Perfume by Charles Baudelaire Read for LibriVox.org by Chris Pyle When with closed eyes and autumn's eaves of gold I breathe the burning odors of your breast, Before my eyes the hills of happy rest Fade in the sun's monotonous fires unfold. Islands of Lethe, where exotic boughs Bend with their burden of strange fruit bowed down. Where men are upright, maids have never grown unkind, But bear a light upon their brows. Led by that perfume to these lands of ease, I see a port where many ships have flown With sails outwearied of the wandering seas while the faint odors from green tamarisks blown float to my soul and in my senses throng and mingle vaguely with the sailor's song end of poem this recording is in the public domain frost at midnight by samuel taylor coleridge read for librivox dot org by winston tharp the frost performs its secret ministry unhelped by any wind the owlet's cry came loud and hark again loud as before the inmates of my cottage all at rest have left me to that solitude which suits abstruser musings save that at my side my cradled infant slumbers peacefully tis calm indeed so calm that it disturbs and vexes meditation with its strange and extreme silentness sea hill and wood this populous village sea and hill and wood with all the numberless goings-on of life inaudible as dreams the thin blue flame lies on my low burnt fire and quivers not only that film which fluttered on the grate still flutters there the sole unquiet thing. Methinks its motion in this hush of nature gives it dim sympathies with me who live, making it a companionable form whose puny flaps and freaks the idling spirit by its own moods interprets, everywhere echo or mirror seeking of itself, and makes a toy of thought. But, oh, how oft, how oft at school with most believing mind, presageful, have I gazed upon the bars to watch that fluttering stranger? And as oft, with unclosed lids, already had I dreamt of my sweet birthplace and the old church tower, whose bells, the poor man's only music, rang from morn to evening all the hot fair day so sweetly that they stirred and haunted me with a wild pleasure falling on mine ear most like articulate sounds of things to come so gazed i 
till the soothing things I dreamt lulled me to sleep, and sleep prolonged my dreams. And so I brooded all the following morn, awed by the stern preceptor's face, mine eye fixed with mock study on my swimming book, save if the door half opened and I snatched a hasty glance, and still my heart leaped up, for still I hoped to see the stranger's face, townsman or aunt or sister more beloved, my playmate when we both were clothed alike. Dear babe that sleepest cradled by my side, whose gentle breathings heard in this deep calm, fill up the interspersed vacancies and momentary pauses of the thought. My babe, so beautiful, it thrills my heart with tender gladness thus to look at thee, and think that thou shalt learn far other lore and in far other scenes. For I was reared in the great city, pent mid cloisters dim, and saw not lovely but the sky and stars. But thou, my babe, shall wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores, beneath the crags of ancient mountain, and beneath the clouds, which image in their bulk both lakes and shores and mountain crags. So shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who from eternity doth teach himself in all, and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit, and by giving make it ask. Therefore all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether the summer clothe the general earth with greenness, or the red-breasts sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow on the bare branch of mossy apple-tree, while the nigh thatch smokes in the sun-thaw, whether the eavedrops fall heard only in the trances of the blast, or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quietly shining to the quiet moon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Goodbye by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio. Goodbye, proud world. I'm going home. Thou art not my friend, and I'm not thine. Long through thy weary crowds I roam. A river arc on the ocean brine, Long I've been tossed like the driven foam. But now, proud world, I'm going home. Goodbye to flattery's fawning face, To grandeur with his wise grimace, To upstart wealth's averted eye, To supple office low and high. To crowded halls, to court and street, To frozen hearts and hasting feet. To those who go and those who come, Good-bye, proud world, I'm going home. I am going to my own hearthstone, Bosomed in yon green hills alone, A secret nook in a pleasant land, Whose groves the frolic fairies planned where arches green the livelong day echo the blackbird's roundelay and vulgar feet have never trod a spot that is sacred to thought and god oh when i am safe in my sylvan home i tread on the pride of greece and rome and when i am stretched beneath the pines where the evening star so holy shines I laugh at the lore and the pride of man, at the sophist schools and the learned clan, for what are they all in their high conceit, when man in the bush with God may meet? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Kiss in the Rain by Samuel Minturn Peck Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio 
One stormy morn I chanced to meet a lassie in the town. Her locks were like the ripened wheat, her laughing eyes were brown. I watched her as she tripped along, till madness filled my brain, and then, and then, I know it was wrong, I kissed her in the rain. With raindrops shining on her cheek, like dewdrops on a rose, the little lassie strove to speak, my boldness to oppose. She strove in vain, and quivering, her fingers stole in mine. And then the birds began to sing, the sun began to shine. Oh, let the clouds grow dark above, my heart is light below. Tis always summer when we love, however winds may blow. And I'm as proud as any prince, all honors I disdain. She says I am her rainbow, since I kissed her in the rain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Last Druid by Constance Naden. Read for the Brimox.org by Newgate Novelist. Despairing and alone, where mountain winds make moan, my days are spent. Each sacred wood and cave is a forgotten grave, where none lament. This is my native sod, but to a stranger god my people pray, till to myself I seem a scarce remembered dream when morn is grey. I know not what I seek, my heart is cold and weak, my eyes are dim. Across the vale I hear an anthem glad and clear, the Christian's hymn. O oh Christ, to whom they sing, thou art not yet the king of this wild spot. I am too weary now at new-made shrines to bow. I know thee not. They say, when death is o'er, man lives for evermore in heaven or hell. They call thee love and light. Alas, they may be right. I cannot tell. But if in truth thou live, if to mankind thou give life, motion, breath, if love and light thou be, no longer torture me, but grant me death. Give me not heaven, but rest, in earth's all-sheltering breast, hide me from scorn. The gods I served are slain, my life is lived in vain. Why was I born? Gone is the ancient race, earth has not any place for such as I. Nothing is true but grief, I have outlived belief, then let me die. These dim, deserted skies, to aged heart and eyes, no comfort give. Woe to my hoary head, woe, for the gods are dead, and yet I live. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lost Pardoner by Badger Clark Jr. Read for LibriVox.org by Jack Monahan. I ride alone and hate the boys I meet. Today, some way, their laughing hurts me so. I hate the mocking birds and the mesquite, and yet I liked them just a week ago. I hate the steady sun that glares and glares. The bird songs make me sore. I seem the only thing on earth that cares, cause Al ain't here no more. Twas just a stumbling horse, a tangled spur, and when I raised him up so limp and weak, one look before his eyes began to blur, and then the blood that wouldn't let him speak. And him so strong, and yet so quick he died. And after year on year, when we had always trailed it side by side, he went and left me here. We loved each other in the way men do, and never spoke about it, Al and me. But we both knowed 
and knowing it so true was more than any woman's kiss could be. We knowed, and if the way was smooth or rough, the weather shine or poor, well, I had him, the rest seemed good enough. But he ain't here no more. What is there out beyond the last divide? Seems like that country must be cold and dim. He'd miss this sunny range he used to ride, and he'd miss me the same as I do him. It's no use thinking, all I'd think or say could never make it clear. Out that dim trail that only leads one way, he's gone and left me here. The range is empty and the trails are blind, and I don't seem but half myself today. I wait to hear him riding up behind and feel his knee rub mine the good old way. He's dead, and what that means no man can tell. Some call it gone before. Where, I don't know, but God, I know so well that he ain't here no more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Mate Can Do No Wrong by Henry Watson. Went for WeatherFox.org by Glen O'Brien, www.glenobrien.net. We learnt the creed of Ungerford, we learnt the creed of Burke, we learnt it in the good times, and learnt it out of work. We learnt it by the arbor side, and on the billabong, no matter what a mate may do, a mate can do no wrong. He's like a king in this respect, no matter what they do, and king-like shares in storm and shine the throne of life with you. We learnt it when we were in jail, and put it in a song. No matter what a mate may do, a mate can do no wrong. They'll say he said a bitter word when he's away or dead. We're loyal to his memory, no matter what he said. And we should never hesitate, but strike out gold and strong. And shot the surrender on the chore, a mate can do no wrong. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Maud and Madge by Julia Caroline Dorr. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Danny Hogger. Maud in a crimson velvet chair strings her pearls on a silken thread, while lovingly lifting her golden hair, soft airs wander about her head. She has silken robes of the softest flow. She has jewels rare and a chain of gold. And her two white hands flit to and fro, fair as the dainty toys they hold. She has tropical birds and rare perfumes, pictures that speak to the heart and eye. For her each flower of the orient blooms, for her the song and the lute swell high. But daintily stringing her gleaming pearls, she dreams today in her velvet chair, while the sunlight sleeps in her golden curls, lightly stirred by the odorous air. Down on the beach, when the tide goes out, Madge is gathering shining shells. The sea breeze blows her locks about. O'er bare, brown feet the white sand swells coarsest surge in her gown of gray faded and torn her apron blue and there in the beautiful dying day the girl still thinks of the work to do stains of labor are on her hands lost is the young form's airy grace and standing there on the shining sands you read her fate in her weary face up with the dawn to toil all day for a meager fare and a place to sleep. Seldom a moment to dream or play, little leisure to laugh or weep. Beautiful Maud, you think, maybe, lying back in your velvet chair, there is naught in common with her and thee. 
You scarce could breathe in the self-same air, but the warm blood in her girlish heart leaps quickly as yours at her nature's call, and ye, though moving so far apart, must share one destiny after all. Love shall come to you both one day, for still must be what a hath been, and under satin or russet gray, hearts will open to let him in. Motherhood with its joy and woe, each must compass through burning pain. You, fair Maud, with your brow of snow, Madge with her brown hands labor stained, each shall sorrow and each shall weep, though one is in hovel, one in hall. Over your gold the frost shall creep, as over her jet the snow will fall. Exquisite Maud, you lift your eyes at Madge out yonder under the sun. Yet know ye both by the countless ties of a common womanhood ye are one. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Midnight Oil by Edna St. Vincent Millay Read for LibriVox.org by Shakira June 2015 Cut, if you will, with sleep's dull knife each day to half its length, my friend. The years that time takes off my life, he'll take from off the other end. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Mother's Question by Julia Caroline Dorr. Read for LibriVox.org. By Danny Hogger. What mother angel tended thee last night, sweet baby mine? Cradled upon what breast all soft and white didst thou recline? Who took thee, frail and tender as thou art, within her arms, and shielded thee, close clasped to the heart, from all alarms? Surely the God who lured thee from the breast that hoped to be the softest pillow and the sweetest rest thenceforth to thee sent thee not forth into the dread unknown without a guide to grope in darkness treading all alone the path untried compassionate is he who called thee child and well i know he sent some blessed one of aspect mild with thee to go through the dark valley where the shadows dim forever brood that the low music of an angel's hymn might cheer the solitude. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. No Second Troy by William Butler Yeats Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp Why should I blame her that she filled my days with misery? Or that she would of late have taught to ignorant men most violent ways, Or hurled the little streets upon the great, Had they but courage equal to desire. What could have made her peaceful, With a mind that nobleness made simple as a fire, With beauty like a tightened bow, A kind that is not natural in an age like this, Being high and solitary and most stern? Why, what could she have done, being what she is? Was there another Troy for her to burn? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Prisoner of Shallan by Lord Byron Read for LibriVox.org by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana Introduction Byron wrote this poem in 1816 at a small inn in the village of Uchi near Lausanne, a city of Switzerland, on the shore of Lake Geneva, also called Lake Le Mans. The castle and fortress of Chalon, which was for a long time a state prison, is at the east end of the lake. 
it is situated on a rock which is almost entirely surrounded by deep water and connected with the shore by a wooden bridge the prisoners introduced in the poem are fictitious persons suggested to the imagination of the poet by the appearance of the isolated castle and no doubt by his reading of the sufferings to which many people were subjected for their religious opinions in past times when the principle of liberty of conscience was little understood or respected the prisoner of Chillon. my hair is gray but not with years nor grew it white in a single night as men's have grown from sudden fears my limbs are bowed though not with toil but rusted with a vile repose for they have been a dungeon spoil and mine has been the fate of those to whom the goodly earth and air are banned and barred forbidden fair but this was for my father's faith i suffered chains and courted death that father perished at the stake for tenets he would not forsake and for the same his lineal race in darkness found a dwelling place we were seven who now are one six in youth and one in age finished as they had begun proud of persecution's rage one in fire and two in field their belief with blood have sealed dying as their father died for the god their foes denied three were in a dungeon cast of whom this wreck is left the last there are seven pillars of gothic mould in chillon's dungeons deep and old there are seven columns massy and gray dim with the dull imprisoned ray a sunbeam which hath lost its way and through the crevice and the cleft of the thick wall is fallen and left creeping o'er the floor so damp like a marsh's meteor lamp and in each pillar there is a ring and in each ring there is a chain that iron is a cankering thing for in these limbs its teeth remain with marks that will not wear away till i have done with this new day which now is painful to these eyes which have not seen the sun so rise for years i cannot count them o'er i lost their long and heavy score when my last brother drooped and died and i lay living by his side they chained us each to a column stone and we were three yet each alone we could not move a single pace we could not see each other's face but with that pale and livid light that made us strangers in our sight and thus together yet apart fettered in hand but joined in heart twas still some solace in the dearth of the pure elements of earth to hearken to each other's speech and each turn comforted to each with some new hope or legend old or song heroically bold but even these at length grew cold our voices took a dreary tone an echo of the dungeon stone a grating sound not full and free as they of yore were wont to be it might be fancy but to me they never sounded like our own i was the eldest of the three and to uphold and cheer the rest i ought to do and did my best and each did well in his degree the youngest whom my father loved because our mother's brow was given to him with eyes as blue as heaven for him my soul was sorely moved and truly might it be distressed to see such bird in such a nest for he was beautiful as day when day was beautiful to me as the young eagles being free a polar day which will not see a sunset till its summer's gone its sleepless summer of long light the snow-clad offspring of the sun and thus he was as pure and bright and in his natural spirit gay with tears for naught but others ills and then they flowed like mountain rills unless he could assuage the woe which he abhorred to view below the other was as pure of mind but formed to combat with his kind strong in his frame and of a mood which against the world in war had stood and perished in the foremost rank with joy 
but not in chains to pine his spirit withered with their clank i saw it silently decline and so perchance in sooth did mine but yet i forced it on to cheer those relics of a home so dear he was a hunter of the hills had followed there the deer and wolf to him this dungeon was a gulf and fettered feet the worst of ills lake Lyman lies by chillon's walls a thousand feet in depth below its massy waters meet and flow thus much the fathom line was sent from chillon's snow-white battlement which round about the wave enthralls a double dungeon wall and wave have made and like a living grave below the surface of the lake the dark vault lies wherein we lay we heard it ripple night and day sounding o'er our heads it knocked and i have felt the winter's spray washed through the bars when winds were high and wanton in the happy sky and then the very rock hath rocked and i have felt it shake unshocked because i could have smiled to see the death that would have set me free i said my nearer brother pined i said his mighty heart declined he loathed and put away his food it was not that twas coarse and rude for we were used to hunter's fare and for the like had little care the milk drawn from the mountain goat was changed for water from the moat our bread was such as captives tears have moistened many a thousand years since man first penned his fellow man like brutes within an iron den but what were these to us or him these wasted not his heart or limb my brother's soul was of that mould which in a palace had grown cold had his free breathing been denied the range of the steep mountain's side but why delay the truth he died i saw and could not hold his head nor reach his dying hand nor dead though hard i strove but strove in vain to rend and gnash my bonds in twain he died and they unlocked his chain and scooped for him a shallow grave even from the cold earth of our cave i begged them as a boon to lay his course in dust whereon the day might shine it was a foolish thought but then within my brain it wrought that even in death his free-born breast in such a dungeon could not rest i might have spared my idle prayer they coldly laughed and laid him there the flat and turfless earth above the being we so much did love his empty chain above it lent such murder's fitting monument but he the favorite and the flower most cherished since his natal hour his mother's image in fair face the infant love of all his race his martyred father's dearest thought my latest care for whom i sought to hoard my life that his might be less wretched now and one day free he too who yet had held untired a spirit natural or inspired he too was struck and day by day was withered on the stalk away oh god it is a fearful thing to see the human soul take wing in any shape in any mood i've seen it rushing forth in blood i've seen it on the breaking ocean strive with swollen convulsive motion I've seen the sick and ghastly bed of sin delirious with its dread. But these were horrors. This was woe unmixed with such. But sure and slow he faded, and so calm and meek, so softly worn, so sweetly weak, so tearless yet so tender, kind and grieved for those he left behind with all the while a cheek whose bloom was as a mockery of the tomb whose tints as gently sunk away as a departing rainbow's ray an eye of most transparent light that almost made the dungeon bright and not a word of murmur not a groan or his untimely lot 
a little talk of better days a little hope my own to raise for i was sunk in silence lost in this last loss of all the most and then the sighs he would suppress of fainting nature's feebleness more slowly drawn grew less and less i listened but i could not hear i called for i was wild with fear i knew twas hopeless but my dread would not be thus admonished i called and thought i heard a sound i burst my chain with one strong bound and rushed to him i found him not i only stirred in this black spot i only lived i only drew the accursed breath of dungeon dew the last the soul the dearest link between me and the eternal brink which bound me to my failing race was broken in this fatal place one on the earth and one beneath my brothers both had ceased to breathe i took that hand which lay so still alas my own was full as chill i had not strength to stir or strive but felt that i was still alive a frantic feeling when we know that what we love shall ne'er be so i know not why i could not die i had no earthly hope but faith and that forbade a selfish death what next befell me then and there i know not well i never knew first came the loss of light and air and then of darkness too i had no thought no feeling none among the stones i stood a stone and was scarce conscious what i wist as shrubless crags within the mist for all was blank and bleak and gray it was not night it was not day it was not even the dungeon light so hateful to my heavy sight but vacancy absorbing space and fixedness without a place there were no stars no earth no time no check no change no good no crime but silence and a stirless breath which neither was of life nor death a sea of stagnant idleness blind boundless mute and motionless a light broke in upon my brain it was the carol of a bird it ceased and then it came again the sweetest song ear ever heard and mine was thankful till my eyes ran over with the glad surprise and they that moment could not see i was the mate of misery but then by dull degrees came back my senses to their wonted track i saw the dungeon walls and floor close slowly round me as before i saw the glimmer of the sun creeping as it before had done but through the crevice where it came that bird was perched as fond and tame and tamer than upon the tree a lovely bird with azure wings a song that said a thousand things and seemed to say them all for me i never saw its like before i ne'er shall see its likeness more it seemed like me to want a mate but was not half so desolate and it was come to love me when none lived to love me so again and cheering from my dungeon's brink had brought me back to feel and think i know not if it late were free or broke its cage to perch on mine but knowing well captivity sweet bird i could not wish for thine or if it were in winged guise a visitant from paradise for heaven forgive that thought the while which made me both to weep and smile i sometimes deemed that it might be my brother's soul come down to me 
but then at last away it flew and then twas mortal well i knew for he would never thus have flown and left me twice so doubly alone lone as the course within its shroud lone as a solitary cloud a single cloud on a sunny day while all the rest of heaven is clear a frown upon the atmosphere that has no business to appear when skies are blue and earth is gay a kind of change came in my fate my keepers grew compassionate i know not what had made them so they were inured to sights of woe but so it was my broken chain with links unfastened did remain and it was liberty to stride along my cell from side to side and up and down and then athwart and tread it over every part and round the pillars one by one returning where my walk begun avoiding only as i trod my brother's graves without a sod for if i thought with heedless tread my step profaned their lowly bed my breath came gaspingly and thick and my crushed heart fell blind and sick i made a footing in the wall it was not therefrom to escape for i had buried one and all who loved me in a human shape and the whole earth would henceforth be a wider prison unto me no child no sire no kin had i no partner in my misery i thought of this and i was glad for thought of them had made me mad but i was curious to ascend to my barred windows and to bend once more upon the mountains high the quiet of a loving eye i saw them and they were the same they were not changed like me in frame i saw their thousand years of snow on high their wide long lake below and the blue rhone in fullest flow i heard the torrents leap and gush o'er channeled rock and broken bush i saw the white-walled distant town the whiter sails go skimming down and then there was a little isle which in my very face did smile the only one in view a small green isle it seemed no more scarce broader than my dungeon floor but in it there were three tall trees and o'er it blew the mountain breeze and by it there were waters flowing and on it there were young flowers growing of gentle breath and hue the fish swam by the castle wall and they seemed joyous each and all the eagle rode the rising blast methought he never flew so fast as then to me he seemed to fly and then new tears came in my eye and i felt troubled and would fain i had not left my recent chain and when i did descend again the darkness of my dim abode fell on me as a heavy load it was as is a new dug grave closing o'er one we sought to save and yet my glance too much oppressed had almost need of such a rest it might be months or years or days i kept no count i took no note i had no hope my eyes to raise and clear them of their dreary moat at last men came to set me free i asked not why and recked not where it was at length the same to me fettered or fetterless to be I learned to love despair and thus when they appeared at last and all my bonds aside were cast these heavy walls to me had grown a hermitage and all my own and half I felt as they were come to tear me from a second home with spiders I had friendship made and watched them in their sullen trade had seen the mice by moonlight play and why should I feel less than they we were all inmates of one place and I the monarch of each race had power to kill yet strange to tell in quiet we had learned to dwell my very chains and I grew friends so much a long communion tends to make us what we are even i regained my freedom 
with a sigh. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Memory of Mohammed Akram at the Tamarind Tank by Lawrence Hope. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. The desert is parched in the burning sun, and the grass is scorched and white. But the sand is past, and the march is done. We are camping here tonight. I sit in the shade of the temple walls, while the cadenced water evenly falls, and a peacock out of the jungle calls to another on yonder tomb above half seen in the lofty gloom strange works of a long dead people loom obscene and savage and half effaced an elephant hunt a musician's feast and curious matings of man and beast what did they mean to the men who are long since dust whose fingers traced in this arid waste these rioting twisted figures of love and lust strange weird things that no man may say things humanity hides away secretly done catch the light of the living day smile in the sun cruel things that man may not name naked here without fear or shame laugh in the carven stone deep in the temple's innermost shrine is set where the bats and the shadows dwell the worn and ancient symbol of life at rest in its oval shell by which the men who of old the land possessed represented their great destroying power i cannot forget that just as my life was touching its fullest flower love came and destroyed it all in a single hour therefore the dual mystery suits me well sitting alone the tank's deep water is cool and sweet soothing and fresh to the way-worn feet Dreaming, under the tamarind shade, one silently thanks the men who made so green a place in this bitter land of sunburnt sand. The peacocks scream and the grey doves coo, little green talkative parrots woo, and small grey squirrels with fear askance at alien me in their furtive glance, come shyly with quivering fur to see the stranger under their tamarind tree. Daylight dies. The campfires redden like angry eyes, the tents show white in the glimmering light, spirals of tremulous smoke arise to the purple skies, and the hum of the camp sounds like the sea drifting over the sand to me. Afar in the desert some wild voice sings to a jangling zither with minor strings, and, under the stars growing keen above, I think of the thing that I love. A beautiful thing, Alert, serene, with passionate, dreaming, wistful eyes, dark and deep as mysterious skies seen from a vessel at sea. Alas, you drifted away from me, and time and space have rushed in between, but they cannot undo the thing that has been, though it never again may be. You were mine from dusk until dawning light for the perfect whole of that bygone night. You belonged to me. They say that love is a light thing, a foolish thing, and a slight thing, a ripe fruit rotten at core. They speak in this futile fashion to me, who am racked with passion, tormented beyond compassion for ever and evermore. They say that possession lessens a lover's delight as radiant mornings fade into afternoon. I held what I loved in my arms for many a night, yet ever the morning lightened the sky too soon. Beyond our tents the sands stretch level and far around this little oasis of tamarind trees. A curious, eastern fragrance fills the breeze from the ruinous temple garden where roses are. I dream of the rose-like perfume that fills your hair, of times when my lips were free of your soft, closed eyes, while down in the tank the waters ripple and rise and the flying foxes silently cleave the air. The present is subtly welded into the past. My love of you with the purple Indian dusk, with its clinging scent of sandal incense and musk and withering jasmine flowers. 
my eyes grow dim and my senses fail at last while the lonely hours follow each other silently one by one till the night is almost done then weary and drunk with dreams with my garments damp and heavy with dew i wander towards the camp tired with a brain in which fancy and fact are blent i stumble across the ropes till i reach my tent and then to rest to ensweeten my sleep with lies to dream i lie in the light of your long-lost eyes my lips set free to love and linger over your soft loose hair to dream i lay your delicate beauty bare to solace my fevered eyes ah if my life might end in a night like this drift into death from dreams of your granted kiss end of poem this recording is in the public domain serenade by james russell lowell sung for LibriVox.org by iswa in belgium in june 2015 from the close shut windows gleams no spark the night is chilly the night is dark the poplars shiver the pine trees moan my hair by the autumn breeze is blown under thy window i sing alone 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 ah, oh, alone the darkness is pressing coldly around the windows shake with a lonely sound the stars are hidden the night is drear the heart of silence throbs in thy ear in thy chamber thou sittest alone 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 ah, oh, alone the world is happy the world is wide kind hearts are beating on every side ah, why should we lie so coldly curled alone in the shell of this great world why should we any more be alone 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 ah, oh, alone oh tis a bitter and dreary world the saddest by man's ear ever heard we each are young we each have a heart why stand we ever coldly apart must we forever then be alone 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 ah, oh, alone eighteen forty end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sparkles from the Wheel by Walt Whitman Read for LibriVox.org by Chris Pyle Where the city's ceaseless crowd moves on the livelong day, Withdrawn I join a group of children watching, I pause aside with them. By the curb toward the edge of the flagging, A knife grinder works at his wheel sharpening a great knife. Bending over he carefully holds it to the stone by foot and knee. With measured tread he turns rapidly as he presses with light but firm hand. Fourth issue, then, in copious golden jets, sparkles from the wheel. The scene and all its belongings, how they seize and affect me. The sad, sharp-chinned old man with worn clothes and broad shoulder band of leather. Myself effusing and fluid, a phantom, curiously floating, now here absorbed and arrested. The group an unminded point set in a vast surrounding 
the attentive, quiet children, the loud, proud, restive bass of the streets, the low hoarse purr of the whirling stone, the light-pressed blade, diffusing, dropping, sideways darting, and tiny showers of gold, sparkles from the wheel. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sun Shower by George Parsons Lathrop Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk A penciled shade the sky doth sweep, And transient glooms creep in to sleep amid the orchard. Fantastic breezes pull the trees Hither and yon to vagaries of aspect tortured. Then like the downcast dreamy fringe of eyelids when dim gates unhinge that locked their tears falls on the hills a mist of rain so faint it seems to fade again yet swiftly nears now sparkles the air all steely bright with drops swept down in arrow flight keen quivering lines ceased in a breath the showery sound and teasingly now as i look around sweet sunlight shines end of poem this recording is in the public domain three doves by george parsons lathrop read for librivox dot org by bruce kachuk seaward at morn my doves flew free at eve they circled back to me the first was faith the second hope the third the whitest charity above the plunging surges play dreamlike they hovered day by day at last they turned and bore to me green signs of peace through nightfall gray no shore forlorn no loveliest land their gentle eyes had left unscanned mid hues of twilight heliotrope or daybreak fires by heaven breath fanned quick visions of celestial grace hither they waft from earth's broad space kind thoughts for all humanity they shine with radiance from god's face ah since my heart they choose for home why loose them forth again to roam yet look they rise with loftier scope they wheel in flight toward heaven's pure dome fly messengers that find no rest save in such toil as makes man blessed your home is god's immensity we hold you but at his behest end of poem this recording is in the public domain the three ships by julia caroline dor read for LibriVox.org by danny hogger over the waters clear and dark flew like a startled bird our bark all the day long with steady sweep seagulls followed us over the deep weird and strange were the silent shores rich with their wealth of buried oars mighty the forests old and gray with the secrets locked in their hearts away semblance of castle and arch and shrine towered aloft in the clear sunshine and we watched for the warder stern and grim and the priest with his chanted prayer and hymn over that wonderful northern sea as one who sails in a dream sailed we till when the young moon soared on high nothing was round us but wave and sky up in the tremulous space it swung a crescent dim in the azure hung while the sun lay low in the glowing west with bars of purple across his breast the skies were aflame with the sunset glow 
the billows were all aflame below the far horizon seemed the gate to some mystic world's enchanted state and all the air was a luminous mist crimson and amber and amethyst then silently into that fiery sea into the heart of the mystery three ships went sailing one by one the fairest visions under the sun like the flame in the heart of a ruby set were the sails that flew from each mast of jet while darkly against the burning sky streamer and pennant floated high steadily silently on they pressed into the glowing reddening west until on the far horizon's fold they slowly passed through its gates of gold you think perhaps they were nothing more than schooners laden with common ore where care clasped hands with grimy toil and the decks were stained with earthly moil o oh, beautiful ships that sailed that night into the west from our yearning sight full well i know that the freight ye bore was laid in not for an earthly shore to some far realm ye were sailing on where all we have lost shall yet be won ye were bearing thither a world of dreams bright as the sunset's golden gleams and hopes were tremulous rosy flush grew fairer still in the twilight hush ye were bearing hence to that mystic sphere thoughts no mortal may utter here songs that on earth may not be sung words too holy for human tongue the golden deeds that we would have done the fadeless wreaths that we would have won and hence it was that our souls with you traversed the measureless waste of blue till you passed under the sunset gate and to us a voice said softly wait end of poem this recording is in the public domain tired tim by walter de la mer read for LibriVox.org by kangaroo six ninety two poor tired tim it's sad for him he lags the long bright morning through ever so tired of nothing to do he moons and mopes the livelong day nothing to think about nothing to say up to bed with his candle to creep too tired to yawn too tired to sleep poor tired tim it's sad for him end of poem this recording is in the public domain up and down by walter de la mer read for librivox dot org by kangaroo six ninety two down the hill of ludgate up the hill of fleet to and fro and east and west with people flows the street even the king of england on temple bar must beat for leave to ride to ludgate down the hill of fleet end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Voice of the Void by George Parsons Lathrop Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk I warn, like the one drop of rain on your face ere the storm, Or tremble in whispered refrain with your blood beating warm. I am the presence that ever baffles your touch's endeavor, gone like the glimmer of dust dispersed by a gust i am the absence that taunts you the fancy that haunts you the ever unsatisfied guess that questioning emptiness wins a sigh for reply nay nothing am i but 
the flight of a breath for i am death end of poem this recording is in the public domain Why dost thou shade thy lovely face? By Francis Quarles, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and holdest me for thy enemy? Job thirteen twenty four. Why dost thou shade thy lovely face? Or why does that eclipsing hand so long deny the sunshine of thy soul enlivening eye? Without that light, what light remains in me? thou art my life my way my light in thee i live i move and by thy beams i see thou art my life if thou but turn away my life's a thousand deaths thou art my way without thee lord i travel not but stray my light thou art without thy glorious sight mine eyes are darkened with perpetual night my god thou art my way my life my light Thou art my way, I wander if thou fly. Thou art my light, if hid, how blind am I. Thou art my life, if thou withdraw, I die. Mine eyes are blind and dark, I cannot see. To whom or whither should my darkness flee, but to the light? And who's that light but thee? My path is lost, my wandering steps do stray. I cannot safely go, nor safely stay. Who should I seek but thee, my path, my way? oh i am dead to whom shall i poor i repair to whom shall my sad ashes fly but life and where is life but in thine eye and yet thou turnst away thy face and fliest me and yet i sue for grace and thou deniest me speak art thou angry lord or only triest me unscreen those heavenly lamps or tell me why thou shadest thy face perhaps thou think'st no eye can view those flames and not drop down and die if that be all shine forth and draw thee nigher let me behold and die for my desire is phoenix like to perish in that fire death conquered lazarus was redeemed by thee if i am dead lord set death's prisoner free am i more spent or stink i worse than he if my puffed light be out give leave to tine my shameless snuff at that bright lamp of thine Oh, what's thy light the less for lighting mine if i have lost my path great shepherd say shall i still wander in a doubtful way lord shall a lamb of israel's sheepfolds stray thou art the pilgrim's path the blind man's eye the dead man's life on thee my hopes rely if thou remove i err i grope i die disclose thy sunbeams close thy wings and stay see see how i am blind and dead and stray o thou that art my light my life my way end of poem this recording is in the public domain yourself by jones very read for librivox dot org by jesse zuba tis to yourself i speak you cannot know him whom I call in speaking such a one, For you beneath the earth lie buried low, Which he alone as living walks upon. You may at times have heard him speak to you, And often wished perchance that you were he, And I must ever wish that it were true, For then you could hold fellowship with me. But now you hear us talk as strangers, Met above the room wherein you lie abed. A word perhaps loud spoken you may get, or hear our feet when heavily they tread. But he who speaks, or he who's spoken to, must both remain as strangers still to you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.